So I'm Tommaso Poggio and uh, um, today we'll have a discussion and we'll do it in the following way that Misha Belkin will speak for 10 minutes and then I'll speak for 10 slides and then uh, um, Lorenzo and uh, uh, Costis and Jill will uh, start uh, questioning and discussing and criticizing what Misha and I have said. And there will be also time for questions from the audience. The best way probably would be to, let's see, raise your hand or uh, maybe using chat to send uh, me a message. All right, so um, uh, it's great to have Misha. Um, thanks to Zoom, he's in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I, I was thinking today that uh, um, you are my grandchild, academically speaking, because um, Parta Nioji, who was your advisor, was a student of mine a long time ago. Uh, Parta was great, unfortunately, he passed away. But, uh, um, but uh, let's, uh, um, let's start uh, with Misha, and he has some very interesting work, uh, not only the one with Parta, but also the one he's speaking today, and some other one more recently that you'll speak maybe next time or soon at CBMM. And this is about overparameterization, interpolation, and essentially the puzzles of modern machine learning. Misha. Thank you, Tommy. So, uh, yeah, so um, I was asked to sort of give a short uh, overview of some problems which are very much inspired by uh, sort of modern interesting aspects of machine learning and some aspects of it which we're uh, starting to understand now. And I, I sort of think it makes sense to frame it as 1.5 lessons of deep learning is that, well, there are actually two lessons here, but I only have time to really discuss one, but I'll just very briefly say something about the second one. And um, so the lessons are the following. And the first lesson, I think, which we are somehow learning now, and that we are starting to understand, is that we need to, um, certain foundations of the statistical learning need to be rethought with a new view of model complexity and overfit. And the second lesson, so that's the lesson for statistics. And the second lesson is for optimization is that we now realize that we need a new theory of non-convex optimization for large systems. And the common thread of these two things is this idea of overparameterization, which really I think has become a kind of one of the main narratives I feel in recent years, sort of explaining empirical phenomena of deep learning and the consequence of that, which is interpolation. Um, so, well, as we know, empirical risk minimization is a, one of the main sort of uh, theoretical foundations of machine learning. And most, well, many, probably most theoretical analysis for machine learning are based on empirical risk minimization. We simply try to minimize empirical risk, the risk on the training data, over a class of functions. And the way this analysis work, and I'm sort of repeating things which we of course know already, but I think probably useful to sort of set this up as a basis for the discussion, is that um, we have, um, it classically has been analyzed by using uniform laws of large numbers. There are many, many various uh, forms of these laws of large numbers, but they're all uh, what you may call busy weak bound. What you see is what you get is that you're comparing expected, or expected risk, which is what we get in the future, to the empirical risk, the risk, the loss on the training data, plus a complexity term, depending on the function complexity, which may or may not be data dependent. Classically, it's not data dependent, but there are actually a lot of bounds now which are data dependent. Well, not just now, starting with margin bounds and even other things we call it. Now, um, this has been a foundation of machine learning. And, you know, if you look at Bapnik's book, he said that the theory of induction is based 
on the uniform law of large number plus capacity control. And the sort of uh, the outcome of the thinking that we all know, and which actually precedes Wapnik, is this U-shaped curve. And the way it works, right, that as we increase complexity from low to high, the training error goes down, but the test error traces this U-shape going from underfitting to overfitting. And sort of the goal of machine learning or the goal of, th the goal of machine learning would be to find this model, which is the bottom of the U. The theory would be somehow to theoretically identify the thing using bounds. And an outcome of this, a uh, corollary of this is that uh, if you fit the data exactly, the model with zero training error will overfit meaning that it will generalize poorly. So that has been the structure of machine learning sort of in just a couple of slides. Um, but empirical evidence actually suggests that this is not exactly true. And you can train in particular a neural net to have 100% training accuracy, yet the test accuracy is still very good. There is no obvious overfitting going on. Indeed, something perhaps even more surprising happens. Well, first, you don't really need to have a neural net here. You can do this with the kernel machine. And you can do the same thing even with data which are very, very noisy, like 60% of the data, or even 80% of the data is noise. So you can fit this kernel machine to fit the data exactly. The data is really noisy, yet you get performance which is close to the base optimal. It doesn't, it doesn't lack the, um, this, so graphically, this is represented by this red line being close to the green line. And this is very counterintuitive from uh, the point of view of um, statistics, because usually we think that fitting noisy data is better. So that's uh, kind of the empirical finding, just to summarize it briefly, is that the goal of optimization, which is interpolation, unexpectedly aligns with goals of learning, which is to minimize the expected loss. I emphasize this unexpectedly here because that I think is something new, at least for noisy data, I think at this point. Um, now, um, by some extra argument, which I'm not going to go through, we can see that WYSIWYG bounds really have a lot of difficulty accounting for this type of generalization. So maybe that's the first lesson of uh, deep learning, which is, for statistics, is that the theory of induction, to use a term from you know, Wapnik, uh, for modern learning, it cannot be based on uniform law of large numbers. And the question, of course, is, well, what, what do we do about this? So where, where should we go next? And well, we don't yet have a full theory of it, or we only have a rather partial theory of it, I would say, for, for rather special cases. And Tommy will have some suggestions about you know, where it may go. Uh, the idea is like stability and uh, understanding inference from that point of view. But we kind of, I think, starting to get some sort of direction. And the direction is based on this picture, that the classical risk curve, it's not, there is nothing wrong with it as such. There is a regime, you may call it classical regime, where you actually get this U-shaped curve. But this is only half of the picture. And the other half of the picture sort of starts when this, U-shaped curve ends, and when the training risk becomes zero. So basically for this over-parameterized model, whose loss is zero, adding parameters usually helps. And in fact, this curve goes down and often goes down indefinitely to, you know, as the number of parameters, as the complexity of edge goes to infinity, it sort of asymptotes and often it goes to U. So this is maybe the kind of view, at least from my point of view, the sort of this modern machine learning of general theory of machine learning need to explain not just the classical part, but the new part. And ideally, of course, both, both at the same time, that would be the sort of grand unification. Um, now, uh, just to give an example, which I think is helpful to have something specific in mind, Taking a very simple neural net with uh, the red points here are my data, just one dimensional data. 
blue lines here is output of a neural net. I'm fixing the first layer. So the first layer just has random weights and I'm only training the second one. So the problem becomes linear regression. And you can see that with three neurons, you get this kind of classical nice statistical fit. With 30 neurons, we get, again, classical overfitting. The curve goes crazy. But with 3,000 neurons, way, way overfit, right? There are just way more parameters than data. It works nicely and you get this nice curve. Now, which is better, three or 3,000? Well, it depends on your model, depends on your data, but they're both, as you can see, sort of reasonable approximations of the data. So that may be a kind of visual picture for what's going on. Now, uh, to connect to um, the idea of stability, is that you can say, well, what if I take this random features, right? I can do different samples. And you can see with uh, 35 random ReLU features, you get overfitting and each one of this curve is kind of crazy. So you get a lot of instability in this regime. Yet when you average those curves, you get this red curve, which is not so bad either. So somehow you can gain stability by averaging, which very reminiscent of bagging. Essentially it's a version of bagging. Um, and interestingly enough, with 3000 random ReLU features, you don't really need any averaging. This, this is very stable. So each of these curves is essentially the same. Average doesn't do very much. And well, if you've seen this, it's kind of reminiscent of boosting. So in a sense, stability clearly connects to this, um, to, to this phenomenon that we observe. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Um, so essentially, if you take like 300, 3,000 parameters, your generalization error is the same as taking, I don't know, um, like 300 parameters and averaging? Well, in this case, there is no actual generalization error because this is just data that I chose somehow. There is no underlying model, so I can't really talk about generalization error. But if you actually do that for say three years, yes, you get something very similar. I, I don't know that it's the same. I don't think it's exactly the same. But the models you get are quite similar. So essentially, you claim that if I overpower. I'm sorry, Jill. I'm sorry. Let's, uh, let's have the question after the two of us speak. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Misha. Okay, so um, I have. Uh, so. This is uh, kind of a sum, well, this is maybe kind of a cartoon on ERM and interpolation, and then I have a couple more slides on optimization. Um, so what do we have with ERM and interpolation? So you can kind of have this um, cartoon of the situation that we have by the following. The classical empirical risk minimization tries to minimize the loss over this class of functions. Now, modern, this is a classical regime. The modern regime minimizes the norm subject to fitting the data exactly. Now, if you look at linear regression, both of them are actually what we call linear regression. One is an underparameterized case, that is overparameterized case. And remarkably, when you optimize it by gradient descent, which is very similar to what people first do in practice with SGD, you don't have to know which one is which. So somehow SGD just knows whether it's under parameters or over parameters, and all this gives you the right solution. It's pretty remarkable. And presumably something similar is happening for neural models. So of course, we understand that much worse than a linear case. So may maybe this is a useful way to think about this, although it's not the full. So uh, let me say a couple of words about the second lesson, just um, two minutes. Um, I think with optimization, what we find is that this, this method like gradient descent or STD extremely efficient. And this is, can be kind of a puzzle from the point of view is like, well, usually when we think about non-convexity and the things are extremely non-convex, we have this picture. There are a bunch of local minima. There is no generally good optimization technique for such things. And it's kind of a mystery why SGD does what it does or GD. However, this picture is deeply misleading, I feel, for overparameterized systems. Really, for overparameterized systems, the picture should be this. 
it's a landscape and the global minima form a valley of local of I'm sorry, of global minima. So it's a whole manifold of global minima with curvature. And the interesting thing about this type of landscape is that it's not convex even locally. So this one is convex locally around every global, every local minimum. This is nowhere convex, not at a single point. But somehow it does matter. You, 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 you can optimize that. So the theory, or maybe this is the second lesson, the theory of optimization for overparameterized systems cannot be based on convexity. And we need sort of new analysis. Well, actually this analysis turned out to be not so new. They go back to a uh, polyak Lyasevich condition, which is, you know, um, back in the 60s. But somehow we need a new view on this overparameterized systems. And this is, a, this is a topic for a separate discussion. So I think I'll stop with this a kind of summary slide. Thank you, Misha. So I think uh, over parameterization, uh, you know, Misha spoke about it, made a, a very good point, but I think it's very important for um, understanding the success of deep learning, deep networks. Uh, my present conjecture, and I would love if somebody could disprove it or prove it, is that the very reason why deep networks perform so well, um, one is because of the, they capture um, quite uh, powerful prior information about the compositionality of certain tasks in visual speech and task, the fact, text, the fact that they can be um, decomposed in terms of the functions um, uh, in the same spirit as parts of parts of parts and holes. So, and the, but the other one is over parameterization, the fact that uh, much better suited than shallow networks to um, deal with the number of parameters that is larger than the number of data. So uh, this is just uh, putting some de definition. Um, we have a training set, pairs of X and Y. We have the expected um, error, which is of the function F, which is the expectation over some um, measure of error like the square error or an exponential error of the function f ex expectation over z. We have the empirical error of f which is measured on the training set from 1 to n. ERM is um, defined as uh, the function that minimizes the empirical error on the training set. This is an infimum, so this is a quasi minimizer bit more general than minimizer. And when we say generalization, uh, technically what is meant in the literature is not predictivity per se, but is convergence of the empirical error of the empirical risk minimizer to the expected error of the minimizer. For n going to infinity where n capital N is the number of examples. And consistency is convergence of the expected error of the minimizer to the best you can do in the function class over which you are minimizing. Like, for instance, reproducing Kernelbert space or a space of, uh, uh, say, some um, smooth functions or compact space of functions, for instance. I will speak like Misha did. He invented the terms which are I think quite good classical regime means number of parameters less than example. Modern regime is number of parameters greater than, the, than examples. And why is this? Is because in the classical theory, um, uh, the Vapnik one and so on, you are assuming that the hypothesis space, the function space is fixed. This means your number of parameters may be large, but is fixed. And this means that at some point, when you go to consider a large n going to infinity, number of examples going to infinity, you are going to be in the situation of the classical regime of n greater than d. Um, and so we know that in the, um, in the classical theory, like uh, Misha uh, said, you, the uniform convergence of large number holds. So in this theory, 
you can prove the empirical risk minimization, so the solution of the empirical risk minimization will generalize, the empirical will converge to the expected, and it will be consistent, so the empirical will be the best you can do, converge to the best you can do in the class, if and only if the function class is uniform, uniform glivenko cantelli which is a class of functions that corresponds to for, um, um, uh, for, for binary function to VC dimension, to finite covering numbers, and so on. So notice, as I said, that um, this theory deals with the classical regime, cannot deal with the modern regime, because in the modern regime, you'd like to keep D greater than N when N goes to infinity, and uh, you cannot do this in the classical framework because H has to be fixed. And as Misha said, um, in the modern regime um, in which the empirical error can be zero, it's in the interpolating case, we cannot expect generalization, in other words, convergence of the empirical to the expected, which will be in general different from zero. So, so we need a new theory. Which kind of theory? Well, an indication is given by the fact that, um, that you know, on the right, you see here the double descent curve that Misha found. This is from his paper on uh, kernel machine, I think, for the test error. And we, we observed when, with Andy and Gil that the condition number of a matrix also has a double descent curve, which is an interesting fact because it says that uh, from the point of view of stability of the solution of a system of linear equation, the worst situation is D equal N, which is the usual, the classical one you study in high school as many are known as equations, and then uh, with some condition of the determinant of the matrix, you can solve it. But this turns to be the most unstable, the worst possible solution. Um, notice that for uh, n um, um, less than d, uh, so the over-parameterized case, you have a an infinite number of solutions in the linear case to the linear system of equations. And you have, uh, uh, in general, zero solution in the underparameterized case when n is greater than d, but you can find a unique solution that minimizes the square error. All right, so um, here is my proposal for a general theory that works for the classical and the modern regime. And this is by using an, a stability that we called uh, 20 years ago in a paper actually with Partha Nioji, uh, Shayan Mukherjee, um, and uh, Ryan Rifkin, we called leave one out cross validation stability. And its definition in expectation is the following in expectation over all the, the training set S for any i, we want. Uh, the absolute value of this difference to be less than certain beta, and we want in the classical regime beta to go to zero as n goes to infinity. So uh, if you look at this, this is measuring uh, the difference in, um, in the loss uh, when zi is in sample, zi is one, um, element of S of the training set and the error by the function trained on SI, which is the training set minus the data point ZI on ZI, the error on ZI. So this is out of sample. This is measuring the difference between in sample and out of sample by perturbing the training set but in one data point. Okay, so we proved, uh, this was uh, 15 years ago, that um, if beta goes to zero for n goes to infinity, uh, this happens if and only if you have a generalization consistency. In other words, if and only if H is UGC. It's completely equivalent to the classical conditions. So this definition captures the 
classical theory, uh, replacing ideas like the C dimension with stability, CV V1 out stability. And what happens in the modern regime? Well, in the modern regime, the term that measure your error in sample, the first one, V of Fs uh, Zi, is zero if you are interpolating. You are overparameterized and interpolating. That's the assumption. And then what remains is the other term, and this is the expected error. So, um, so in this case, we have this trivial result that severely one out stability in expectation is equivalent to the expected error. Notice that we can um, use the idea in this case of looking at the perturbation of the train, the effect of that perturbation in the training set, because for instance, this example of the square loss, linear regression, the yi is exactly equivalent to um, ws, the weights in the linear regression obtained by training on s, xi, because of interpolation. And so we are still measuring here the, the difference between the w subscript s and the w subscript si. Now, um, a more interesting statement is that for ERM, in both the classical and modern interpolating regime, minimization of the beta minimizes the expected error. Uh, so that would be uh, unifying pictures. And furthermore, what does it mean um, you know, optimizing stability, minimizing beta CV. Well, this is uh, um, uh, still being done, but the result seems pretty clear, is that for both kernel machines and deep networks, minimizing beta CV in the modern regime is equivalent to select the minimum norm solution. This is true. So in the linear case, uh, linear regression, this is equivalent to selecting the pseudo-inverse among all the infinite number of solutions. Uh, same essentially for the kernel regression, and this is true also for uh, deep networks. And so this also by itself kind of explain the double descent curve that Misha found in the, the test error of kernel machines. Now, um, these are a couple of observations, is that in the classical regime, you just look for the minimizer of the empirical risk, and then this is your, uh, the solution that will uh, general, uh, will predict well. For the modern regime, ERM is not enough because typically will give you a lot of solutions that fit the data. You have, in addition to ERM, select one of these solutions. And, um, you select the minimum norm one, as, as Misha said. But this is an extra step in addition to empirical risk minimization. However, if you are using gradient descent algorithms to perform empirical risk minimization, then this extra step is not needed because gradient descent will do it for you. Um, th there was a proof that under the exponential type loss, like the exponential loss or cross entropy, um, gradient descent techniques um, converge to the minimum norm solutions independently of the initial conditions. Uh, this is the same to say they converge to maximum margin solutions. So uh, th this, this I think uh, um, gives the clear connection between minimum norm stability and uh, gradient descent. Now, if we want to be a, just a philosophical thought here, uh, one can think of uh, learning theory as a metaphor for telling us when theories in science are scientific, are predictive. Um, so in the classical regime, um, doing the right thing means that you have a fixed small set of theories and then you pick the one which fits the data best. 
This is the Vapnik point of view. In the modern regime, um, the idea is you choose a theory from a large hypothesis set, which actually you can even increase when new data arrive, before new data arrive, and you choose the hypothesis that fit the data, and then among them, you, you look for the simplest one. This is like Occam Razor or Einstein saying, um, choose a simple, the simplest theory you can, you can have. And all of this can be summarized by the principle of selecting the most stable theory, the one that changes the least if data are perturbed, or changes the least when new data arrive. Most of the time, remember, is an expectation, is in high probability. So scientific revolutions in the sense of Thomas Kuhn are allowed, but not too often. And all of this is kind of a tautology, and of course, mathematics is tautology by definition. So um, let me finish here. Uh, this is just uh, uh, a tribute to Adamard, who um, defined well post problem and deep post problem. And so let me now, let's see, open the discussion to um, maybe we should have some question about what Misha said and I said from the audience. And then we have uh, Gil Strang and, uh, and Costis and Lorenzo um, comment um, and criticize what Misha and I said. So first, the audience. Any question? I will, uh, Misha and I actually had, uh, had this discussion. Uh, okay. If, uh, if um, actually, if you have a gradient system and you're wondering whether it tends to a unique minimum, the condition for that is not convexity, it's contraction. Okay, it's contraction in the sense of contracting dynamical systems. And convexity corresponds to contraction in an identity metric, uh, where actually you could have contraction in any metric and it would still tend towards a unique minimum. Okay. You can also show that if a system is semi-contracting, uh, then actually if you take a gradient descent, then it will tend towards a global minimum and that all equilibrium points will correspond to the same cost. All equilibrium points will be global minima. And also all equilibrium points will be path connected by a path of points, which all have are all equilibrium and all have the same cost. So very much like the drawing that Misha gave at the same at the end. Uh, you know, I, I was suggesting to Misha that we should have a separate CBMM discussion in a couple of weeks about optimization. Um, and I think we should speak about um you know predictivity and, and stability today but misha do you want to answer jean jacques for quickly yeah uh yeah it's um it's a very closely related issue right the, um so jean jacques is uh has a closely related analysis for the continuous dynamics case and uh, we have this analysis for um, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. There, there is, I think there are some important differences between the continuous dynamics and the discrete dynamics, but this phenomenon seems to be very general. I actually suspect that the phenomenon may be even more, there seems to be even more to it than that. Like why, why, you, why even like think that this method? Maybe there is like a much broader class of things which could be uh, could be somehow put into this framework. But but I'm happy to have this discussion. You know, next time uh, maybe we can concentrate on um, generalization issues right now. So I think I would like to to have Gil Strang. Um, comment on what he heard. Gil, of course, is the prince of linear algebra, uh, not only at MIT, and uh, um, I, I know he was very interested in, in this double descent phenomena. Gil, 
So I was just saying that I wish, I mean, this isn't linear algebra, this is really nonlinear. And uh, I was, I think it's great that this Polyot condition uh, seems to be exactly right, or PL, PL star seems exactly right for these problems. Uh, is this something we knew, or is this essentially something uh, new that that uh, the right way to prove convergence is with the Polyox condition? Misha. Um, well, uh, I, I mean, Polyox, of course, came up with that condition a long time ago, right? It's like, I think the 63. So, so in a sense, yes, we knew it. Um, did we know for, I, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of recent analysis which are essentially doing something very similar to this. So in, in a sense, yes, I don't think the PL condition was directly identified there um, as a sort of mathematical structure. So maybe that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the new part of that. Um, I think the well, uh, I think to me, I, I think to me at least what was, um, um, I, I think the interesting bit was that somehow this essential non-convexity of the landscape, but that the landscape is never convex, not even locally, which just seems a very- But, it's, but the minima are convex. Um, what? The global minima are convex. The no, no, it's, it's, not, it's not even convex around any, so, so there is not a single point, but generically for a generic nonlinearity, of course you can. But on the, on the, where the gradient is zero, the Hessian is positive definite, a positive semi-definite. Semi-definite, semi-definite. Yeah. So, so you cannot really speak about convexity at one point, right? Convexity has to be in a neighborhood. So there is no neighbor, so yes, it's positive semi-definite at a point, but if you take any neighborhood of that point, it's not positive semi Yeah, but the Hessian is positive semi-definite. Only at the actual minimum. Yeah. But not nowhere else. In, in continuous time, the polya condition is just saying that the minimum cost, the, the residual cost is exponentially convergent. It's a, in, in continuous time, the polya condition is a one-line proof, right? Is just saying the residual course is exponentially convergent and gives you directly the, the polyar condition. Guys, can we go back to stability <laughs> and generalization? I will do the optimization in two weeks from now. Maybe Jean Jacques will organize. No, no, no. It, it, it was just to, to, to comment on Gail's question. No, 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 no. I'm <laughs> um, okay. Gail, do you want to say more or should I ask Costis? Go ahead to Costas. I'll, I'll uh, Costas. Costas is uh, in CSAIL um, and uh, very well known, very nice guy, Costas. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so uh, I found both uh, talks very uh, illuminating. Um, over, like, uh, and just to step back a little bit, I think it's great that uh, deep networks and deep learning are. Uh, asking us to rethink all these foundations. Uh, in particular, coming from, a, so I'm a theoretical computer scientist and um, in algorithms, we of, often take a worst case uh, perspective on the problems we're studying. Uh, similarly, ERM could be thought of as a worst case perspective on learning problems. And here, sort of like, uh, uh, you know, we have to face the fact that, uh, uh, you know, this, let's say, worst case perspective is not gonna give us uh, the full picture. I mean, uh, at least it doesn't <laughs> give us the picture of what's going on. So um, Misha's work and Tommy's work uh, have been illuminating on that front of what uh, we could expect. Uh, just to push more on the going away from the worst case uh, perspective, uh, what I would like to, you to discuss is a little bit uh, so the the um, sort of like the observations uh, uh, as well as the theory proposed by uh, Tommy uh, do not talk at all about uh, exp trying to exploit any structure in the data. Uh, uh, so how, how like if I would like to push on that front, so the fact that 
images are not worst case distributions in Rn. Okay, so I, I doubt there is any theory that talks about uh, worst case distributions in Rn. You're not gonna you're not gonna generalize those distributions. So what I would like to understand is if I would like to push this concept, I mean, make use of the stability proposal or, you know, or, or, or push on the front of, you know, proving generalization bounds for deep lear learning, how I would go about exploiting structure in the distribution? Um, okay. Um, I think uh, uh, I have some answer, but they're disconnected from the uh, stability consideration. They have to do with approximation theory and the representation power. So the, the, the fact is that um, from the point of view of theory of approximation, um, both shallow networks, one hidden layer like support vector machines or one layer deep networks are with an RLU nonlinearity and deep networks, both of these, those architecture can approximate arbitrarily well a continuous function of compact support. So there is no advantage of deep networks in that case. But um, in general, both of them suffer from the curse of dimensionality. So um, the number of parameters that are needed to get an approximation in the subnorm of epsilon depends exponentially on the dimensionality of the function. So it's like epsilon to the minus d. And so if d is uh, uh, large, like uh, the number of pixels in an image, this becomes easily larger than the number of electrons in, the, in our universe. Um, okay, so that's a real problem. But it turns out that there are certain functions that uh, are a subclass of compositional functions. So these are functions of functions of functions where the inner functions have low dimensionality. So think of a binary tree where each node is a function of two variable. This and consider function that have a binary tree structure. Then it turns out that deep networks can, with appropriate architecture, which turns out to be very similar to convolutional deep networks, deep networks can avoid the curse of dimensionality and shallow networks do not. So I think the, so. This is not true for every function, but there are certain problems, especially in vision and text and speech, where this compositionality is likely to hold in the underlying target function. But, but if I may, if I may uh, add, though, that does not talk about generalization. It talks about representation. Yeah. So, so um, uh, you know, trying to explain uh, why you know, deep nets learn well through some uh, training procedure might at some point have to take into, I mean, you know, I guess the stability proposal explains the potential how this may happen. But if I want to understand sort of like, you know, like that coefficient beta or, or whatever symbol you were using beta for how stable you are, uh, I, I would have to prove something that is, uh, I believe, uh, making use of some structure in the in the data. Yeah, this is, I think, the first slide I showed. Um, so the stability issue is uh, the second point here. I think uh, to answer your question, the first question, the first point is also important. This was always telling about. Yes, so for and, the representation. And we, you know, I, I, I don't know whether, whether this is true and I don't know how to connect one to two. I think mm. that's, so uh, yeah, it's open. But, so ju but, but just understand your definition though. So your stability has an expectation outside. I wanted to understand if that expectation you have in your definition is distribution dependent or is for a fixed data set. Could you bring up your Stability implies generalization slides. Yeah, so could you parse this for us, please? Like the K 
can I put an expectation of a data set used in the, I, I could in principle do that, right? Yeah, there is an expectation over the data set. So maybe the structure in the distribution might come handy in getting you a better bound beta if you put another expectation around. Yeah, yeah, that would be a possibility. Yes. I think that could be, I don't know. It seems you have to restrict also the F somehow, um, you know, to be of this uh, hierarchically local compositional structure. Um, anyway, yes, very interesting, I think. Yeah, I, I'm kind of, um, I kind of feel that um, there are, there are, there are three things. So, so I, I kind of talk about these two lessons, right? One for optimization, one for generalization. Um, and there, there is really the third. Well, first, we don't actually even know very well how those two lessons really are connected together. We, we, well, we, we are sort of trying to identify the mechanisms, but, but there is a third lesson, which is somehow in addition to them, maybe orthogonal is this, this notion of depth and how this compositionality works and why it rating certain structures in the network, why it recovers this manifold and why is it compatible with this optimization strategy. So somehow, okay, as an over-parameterized system, the deep network may be not that different from a shallow net, but it does, as a generalization, it does seem to be capturing this manifold and it seems to be capturing this manifold uh, at least for tasks like vision, I don't know about like generic tasks, but for things like vision, it seems to be significantly better than what you can do with the shallow network. So, so it seems that we're missing one layer of understanding somehow in this understanding of the depth. Mm -hmm. so, so perhaps, yeah, it, it's not an answer to your question, but maybe just to identify the issue. Right. So I guess uh, it's what Tommy was saying, connecting one and two in uh, the slide he showed us. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, the, the structure, there is this theorem here, um, which is just about approximation. Right. Um, so this is a compositional function uh, with uh, uh, local constituent functions here, dimension two for each one. And uh, um, this is basically a convolutional network without weight sharing. The weight sharing case will be the one in which G12, G11, G13, so the, the constituent function at the bottom level um, are all the same. This would be weight sharing. But interestingly, it's not weight sharing, but it's locality of the constituent function that avoids the exponential curse of dimensionality. Um, yeah. Okay, let before uh, we get too far on this, let's uh, let me ask Lorenzo. Lorenzo, whether he has anything to say. Lorenzo survives yeah. a COVID scare in Italy, and so it's yeah, our good. international representative, um, and it and also. Um, we should get him to speak before he falls asleep because six oh, it's hours. Okay, it's nine. <laughs> okay. Okay, Lorenzo, any um, biting criticism? It was great. But I wonder if uh, you might want to comment on the role of, uh, I think there was a bit of a conflation between uh, parameters and dimensions. I think when you talk about things like uh, neural networks or kernel methods, you can talk about the number of points, the size of the function space, but then you have the dimension of the data. To me, uh, that's kind of the most important ingredient in this old story about uh, having to do something new with respect to the past. And uh, Misha was showing this one example in one dimension. So one can say, well, that was one dimension. So if it happens in one dimension, but I don't know if this was exactly, um, you know, random data, but uh, if you take 10 points in one dimension, you don't get them so nicely spaced as you showed. You end up having, with very high probability, two points that are extremely close. And I think this fact, the fact that you might have, you know, functions in a domain 
and then you might have points scattered in the domain and the relative distance of the point in the domain actually plays a very big role in this whole story. And uh, in fact, the fact that you might have stability or not, and the fact that you might have a small or big hypothesis space is regarding uh, the number of parameters. I think to me, you know, as a theoretician, basically depends primarily on this, on what I would call the, what is sometimes called the separating distance between the point or the field distance. So, you know, in neither one of your talks, this um, aspect was, addressed and I wondered, you know, I thought it was a good point to comment on and discuss a bit. Either you or Misha. I think, you know, Misha, I think he had this one, I think, you know, I, I just thought of it because he had this one dimensional plot and I was like, oh, that's one dimensional, but look, these points are very nicely spaced. I mean, they were not perfectly grid, but definitely not close to each other. And I would like to see how well a 3000 parameters network works when you start to have two points that are very close to each other. I, I mean, I'm, the double descent might have a different shape, maybe. Yeah, I think, Lorenzo, I think it's a good point. I think uh, uh, the separation... And it's not optimization. No, that's good. <laughs> um, but so this could also, also, also um, beyond the fact that it's not optimization, is it? I think, uh, you know, separation is... Uh, an ingredient to have stability, for sure. In the linear case, in the linear case, um, you get, uh, you definitely get instabilities if you get points that uh, are too close. In the limit case, if you get uh, two points that are identical, but have different y's, then you cannot have interpolation. So one of our hypotheses falls away. Yeah, so if uh, I add to this, yeah, this is really a, a great question, Lorenzo. Uh, in the, I, 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 I think you, you're right. I mean, the points were sort of reasonably spaced, so you get a nice curve. If you start moving them together, I actually haven't tried this, but I'm pretty sure you, you, you start getting more and more instability as you move them close together. For, for Gaussian kernel, I know this for sure for that specific kernel. But um, uh, so the interesting thing is that it seems that we are somehow getting this blessing of dimensionality for free here. Well, not for free, for, for something. Uh, because somehow in high dimension, as we know, uh, the field distance becomes much larger in high dimension, right? Because if you have points in large dimension, the distances between them are much more similar than in low dimension. And you can really see that with Gaussian kernels. If you try doing interpolation in the low dimension with Gaussian kernel minimum norm, like in dimension two, once you have more than, I don't know, like 50 points, you basically cannot do it. The matrices are too degenerate. You just get uh, out of numeric accuracy. But if you have, say, 10 or 20 dimensions, it works just fine. So there is some sort of, certainly there is this interaction with dimensionality of the space and the dimensionality of the data is important. And uh, I don't think we have theoretical understanding of what it is, but clearly these problems are easier and they work better in higher dimension, at least for kernels which are very smooth, like the Gaussian. Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent point. That that's, uh, I think that's something that we need to understand for sure. Because I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's good to remember this because, you know, the kernel machines have infinitely many parameters. Sparse models tend to have bases which are order of magnitudes more than a number of points. So this number of parameters, larger number of points regime has been going on for like several years. So maybe that's not really what's new. What's new is the interplay between number of points, dimensions, and parameters. But well, least, I, I mean, what's new is really driving the error to zero on noisy data. Yeah, yeah. which, which happens in a good, you know, <laughs> which happens when the dimension is high enough and the number of points is more enough. Yeah, that I think is the kind of, yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree that the over parameterization as such is not such a new concept. But I think this interplay of fitting the noisy data exactly and the parameterization is a new aspect of that. But yeah, you go back to splines, of course, they're 
infinitely parameterized. Okay, so um, are there questions from the audience? Let me ask a question about uh, Tommy's observation on the expected condition number and the new, the nonlinear, Misha's nonlinear condition number. Does, does Tommy's observation carry over directly to give a double descent curve for the, the nonlinear problem condition number or are the, how are the two condition numbers connected? Misha, do you want to, uh, which condition, which nonlinear condition number are you referring to, um, Gil? I'm thinking of the one in Misha's paper, the, the, the long paper with uh, the, the new paper. We decided not to speak about it. That's about optimization. This will be in two weeks. <laughs> but is condition number okay? Can we speak about that part? All right. <laughs> yeah, because that's because well, that, that's a piece of uh, of the of Misha's paper and a and a key observation of yours. Yeah. Okay, Misha, you have to explain which definition you have for the nonlinear condition number. Yes. So so we have this nonlinear condition number, which um, essentially okay, it's not exactly that, but maybe it's just easiest to think as kind of the you you take a neighborhood of the point and you just take the worst condition number for the tangent kernel with, or in that neighborhood. Um, so the, of the loss function. Um, uh, not of the loss function of the so so it's a condition number of the map. It's not yeah yeah it's not the loss function. It's actually the so so if you just right. think about optimization right you just have a map and you just evaluate it on your data point you don't care about anything else right because that's only the optimization problem. So you have a map which is represented so it's a map from R um, R n to R n when n is a number of training points which is given by your neural net. And you can view it as a function of a parameters W. So you have F of W, which is a map from, uh, it's a nonlinear system of equation, right? You are trying to solve F of W equals Y. So optimization is just a nonlinear system of equation. In machine learning, it's just that. Uh, now you can look at FF, say, okay, I'm going to take the tangent kernel of that, which is simply taking the derivative transpose times the derivative of this map. That's a matrix whose size is d by d, uh, n, n by n. And uh, you can just take in a neighborhood, you take the worst condition. It's not exactly that, but it's very similar to the worst condition. Now, uh, how does it relate to, uh, Tommy, how does it relate to your condition number, which is kind of, I mean, your argument is for generalization. This is so. So in that paper, we show essentially that if this condition number can be controlled, then optimization works. But so the key question whether there could be a double descent behavior of this nonlinear condition number. Yeah, I mean, if uh, if it's a question for me, I, I think it's very likely we couldn't really prove it. So our proof works primarily in the over-parameterized case. So it doesn't really kind of, it, it's kind of tricky to analyze it like near the actual interpolation boundary. So uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm convinced that it should be true. I don't know how to prove it. Uh -huh. that's my, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm probably asking in well into the second descent into the overparameterized part. Well, do we have an idea of expected condition number, uh, like Marchenko Pasteur for the linear case? Perhaps that's pretty complicated. We can control that condition number for large enough networks using, it seems quite, yeah, so the way we can, yeah. So yes, kind of, it, it's not so bad actually, because we, we can control it at initialization using some Marchenko Pasteur type of stuff, which actually was proven by uh, uh, 
several people, like Simon Du had some version of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the kind of key observation is that uh, for large enough neural networks, you can prove that along the optimization path, the tangent tunnel doesn't change very much, and that allows for the control of the, in the whole neighborhood, along the whole path. So we can kind of control it. It's not completely satisfactory since it depends too heavily on the fact that it's this tangent kernel is kind of close to constant. It, at least the change is small, right. which right. seems like a kind of too special, but, but probably this is just the deficiency of the analysis. It seems like it has to be a more general fact. Thanks. But maybe there is a kind of a really interesting uh, sort of different question about it, right? How is conditioning for optimization relates to this conditioning for stability, right? Because they seem to rely on a very similar type of uh, mathematical property of the systems. But either this property seems to arise in different ways in these two cases. So maybe that gives a little bit of a hint why those optimization methods um, somehow respect generalization. I don't know, Tommy, if you have any sort of thoughts. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this reminds me of the fact that originally when we did the work with Partha on stability, the, my initial observation that started this was that um, the condition to have a well-posed optimization um, in machine learning were very similar to the condition for generalized for for predictivity and uh, um, and, and and so th that was puzzling and uh, um, and in fact we found therefore this stability condition so um, so maybe yeah my hint is that you are right there is a deep connection between optimization and uh, and the good you know test error but work to be done um, can i make a comment yeah so i think perhaps one uh, one technical aspect of the condition number and the polyak lovesevich condition and the relation to stability is that usually this kind of uh, convexity condition like polyak lovesevich and related ideas are local around the global minimizer or a global minimizer of the objective function. So they're not global properties of the linear, the system of linear equations or the function to be optimized. They're local around the minimizer. And so, um, well, this is in stark contrast to what happens with other notions of convexity or condition number that are global. Say you can, in my view, I mean, when, when I think of this kind of polyclovesivage, I think of a local condition number on not only locally in sense of a neighborhood, but potentially on a subset sub, or subspace of the whole space. So you kind of have to go around the minimizer and project, uh, potentially project on some subset. And then you have a notion of condition number. So that's one big difference. And I think it really, I wanted to make this comment because I think it relates what, to what Costi was talking about. So this is a property of a minimizer of the true distribution error. So it really depends, it's really a structural assumption on the true distribution. And it's not just a property of the objective. It's really about a property of how the, you know, the best possible solution induced by the, by the true distribution. So it's a very structural assumption because it's local around the global minimizer or a global minimizer. There's a bit of a technical comment, I guess. Lorenzo, could you maybe explain a little bit? Because you do get around the initialization point. It somehow it is true that it's local, but it somehow holds around the initialization, right? But I mean, the condition is usually that you need a, a you, you basically say that there is a neighborhood or maybe an intersection of a neighborhood with a subset, and the neighborhood is taken around the minimizer, and then you need curvature around there. That's typically what you do in this kind of conditions. If you assume it to have it globally, that's a much stronger condition. 
but usually these conditions are local. They're, they're in the neighborhood of the minimizer. Well, they're kind of local, but they're not uh, so local, right? They're somehow in the neighborhood of initialization, and that neighborhood includes the minimizer. And this is kind of true once you well, have that's, a that's, that's the cheating part of this whole story when you assume. So typically, the way it really goes is that you assume that the condition is true on the minimizer, and then you cross your finger that your initialization is also in the neighborhood. Because then at that point, in some sense, you're in the right place already. If, you're in, if your initialization and the global minimizer are far away, then you know you don't get anywhere. So I mean that's the typical way they do in nonlinear problems, you know, both in for stability and convergence. You have to have some nice property about your global minimizer and then start closing up to it. So I, I mean that's the way I see it. So if you, you said it reverse, you said I have the nice property around the initialization and the minimizer is closed. Well, either way, you have this nice property somewhere and both initialization and global minimizer are there. That's not the way I view it. You see, I, I kind of feel that overparameterization allows you to have it around the initialization. And once you have it around the initialization, you're guaranteed that the minimizer is closed. So it's kind of That's reversing that story in a sense. Right, right. But, they, but in a very fundamental way, I, I mean. Anyway. Yeah, it's a technical conjecture that I was mentioning to Misha is that uh, um, the um, classical situation in machine learning, especially in the um, underparameterized case, is that the loss function is a Morse function. And the, the modern situation overparameterized for deep networks um, at least under the condition of Misha was studying, which are not completely general, they don't include the rest nets or so. But uh, those conditions could be a Morse bot function. Does anybody understand what I said? <laughs> Um, so, in other words, uh, you could have essentially degenerate um, manifolds at the minima. Uh, that's fine. And that this would be, it. we know that it's easy to prove that in, for deep networks overparameterized, um, your global minima are degenerate. So, you have. Um, the, the, you have, uh, um, you know, multiple zero, um, multiple solutions of your interpolation equations. So Tommy's comment that ResNets are not included here. Can you say a little more about that? Well, I, they're not included in the optimization paper of Misha, if I'm correct. Um, we should ask him, but. Yeah, well, the, the, we prove it for, um, I think for deep networks, we prove it for fully connected. Um, and also very wide, right? Um, well, not very wide. The width is um, kind of linear in the, well, it's complicated because it depends on this. Okay. Yeah, well, very or not very, I guess it, it depends. It, it seems actually that better than, uh, yeah, in, in any case, it's somewhat wide, I would say. Um, yeah, it seems like it's more of a technical issue rather than conceptual. So I'm, I'm convinced that the condition itself is true, but, uh, you know, the proof kind of gets a little hairy. So it, it's probably just, we didn't find quite the right way to prove that thing. Okay, um, any more questions or comments? Costis, you are happy? <laughs> oh, I'm good. I, this obviously requires uh, more thinking uh, to process, right? Um, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, you know, like, I mean, I, I, can, I, can, I can follow up a little bit on uh, Lorenzo's question or, you know, a little debate, but I, I guess one thing that I was always confused about is 
yeah, you can prove that uh, close to the initialization there will be an, uh, 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 you know, like a, a solution that fits the data. But I guess I don't understand how then you do the jump to generalization after that. Like, is like, how do you talk about, like there are many, multi, the many optimal solutions that fit the data. And you know, like the one that you, that is close to the initialization, why is that a good one? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of a mystery, actually. I, I agree. Uh, we don't we don't know. Uh, so, well, okay. For linear regression, we understand it pretty well because if you start linear regression at zero, you converge to the minimum norm solution, and presumably we believe that minimum norm solutions are not more good; they're more stable. They have all these properties. Now, when we actually train these networks in practice, right? We start with some sort of randomly chosen initialization. We run SGD for a while. We get convergence to something which has well, not, not exactly zero, but small loss. Um, but we can actually run it for a long time, get even smaller loss, it still works fine. Um, and uh, uh, why is this solution has the property that it generalizes? So it looks, it seems to me that right now we have analysis of convergence for optimization and some analysis of generalization. And they're somehow not completely, not, not completely aligned yet. So it's... Um, yeah, maybe it's a, actually this is an interesting point. You're speaking about square loss or uh, mission? Well, it doesn't matter so much, right? It's... Um, because if... Uh, if we're speaking about exponential loss, then we know that gradient descent techniques will converge to minimum norm solutions. This only assumes that at some point during gradient descent, um, you are separating the data. So, um, the classification error is zero. And then you, you can prove that it will converge to a minimum norm. And this is independent of the initial conditions. So uh, this is true I only for, this can, yeah. it's only true for the exponential type loss functions. So I don't think this can be the full story because what we see at least empirically is for the square loss. So even for linear, right? For the square loss, uh, you, if you, well, in, in any case, we know that for square loss, um, essentially the empirically performance is very similar, but you cannot have this analysis based on going to infinity. Uh, it's okay, it's a technical kind of issue, but, but it, it seems that there is, some, I don't know, I, I don't, I think this kind of, the, the, I, okay, here is my sort of conjecture, is that the story cannot depend heavily on the loss function, because from empirical uh, point of view, we don't see that there is a huge difference in the way how the things perform. Well, we find a pretty big uh, empirical difference between exponential and square loss. Uh, for difficult problems, but see, uh, apart, apart from this, I think I I believe what you are saying. I believe also that it should not, you know, theoretically should not make such a big difference. What I'm saying is that for the exponential loss, we have a proof of convergence to the minimum norm solution for uh, uh, kernels and for uh, um, for kernel machines, for linear system, and also for deep networks. I don't know how to extend that proof to the square loss. It's probably just a technical problem. I'm just saying, I don't know. So Tommy, can you, can you quantify a little bit the claim you're making? Are you making a big width assumption like you, it can, you, you uh, can- No, there, there is no assumption really. It's, uh, I mean, uh, you, gradient descent does not always uh, work, right? I mean, you, you're- Right, really, no, so no, no. One big assumption I'm making is that at some point during gradient descent, you are separating the data. Separating means you are classifying, and speaking about binary classification for simplicity, 
And I'm saying that your function has the correct sign for each data point in the training set. This is a big assumption because right. the data set could get right. stuck and never separate the data. But if you, if you get to a point where it separates the data, and empirically, you get there most of the time for data sets, uh, even large data sets, right? Um, then um, we have the proof that we converge to maximum margin minimum norm solutions. But I don't know, just for technical reason, how to right now how to extend the proof to um, to square to, to loss functions different from exponential type. Okay, I think we are at the point in which um, I think we have some interesting results. Thanks, Misha. And, uh, and I think these results are interesting not only for deep learning, but uh, more generally for a number of other uh, problems like uh, linear algebra, perhaps. And uh, and there are a lot of open questions, so it'd be great uh, to have help in uh, answering at least some of them. And I uh, think we'll uh, try to, to have um, maybe an optimization discussion like this one in uh, a couple of weeks or so, uh, if Misha is willing to spend some more time with us. And, sure, I would. <laughs> okay, and and so let me thank Misha, and Jill, and Costis, and Lorenzo, and all of you for participating. Um, keep safe. Continue to wash your hands. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.